there's two things you can count on on the round table. That's I'm going to be here and that's my internet's going to go out. Welcome back because it's episode 253 of Bourbon Pursuit. I'm one of your hosts, Kenny. And on our news this week, we selected a barrel of wheat whiskey from Old Elk. But we are also joined by special guest and master distiller Greg Metz, who you might recall back from episode 154 because he was also the previous master distiller for that big factory in Indiana we call MGP. Now, virtual barrel picks, they might be the new normal for a while. So we're looking forward to bringing more of those to you via live streams. So make sure that you are subscribed to our YouTube channel so you don't miss a single one of them. Now on to the news. Willett Distillery's master distiller Drew Colesveen has been named a finalist for the coveted James Beard Award for Outstanding Wine, Beer, or Spirits Producer. The James Beard Foundation Awards honor the best in food dining, from cookbooks and rising chefs to the best restaurants and, of course, distilleries in the U.S. Time Magazine even called it the Oscars of the food world. Drew Colesveen first joined Willett Distillery back in 2003, and over time, he's developed mash bills that extend the company's bourbon and rye portfolio, which earned him four semi-finalist nominations for the James Beard Award. However, this is the first year that he's actually been named a finalist. So hats off to Drew, congratulations, and awesome work on the recognition. The winners for the James Beard Awards will be announced on September 25th. The 2020 release of the Michter's 10-year-old single barrel Kentucky Straight Bourbon Whiskey will go on sale this May of 2020. It is 94.4 proof and it will sell for a suggested retail price of around $130 in the US. New bottles of Larceny Barrel Proof and Elijah Craig Barrel Proof will be coming soon to a shelf near you, both bearing the code B520. The letter B means it's the second release of the year. Digit 5 means it was released in the fifth month of the year, which is May. And the last two digits, you guessed it, 2020, denote the year. The new batch of Elijah Craig Barrel Proof will come in at 127.2, which is on the lower end of the spectrum for the line. And the Larceny Barrel Proof is now in its second release and will be bottled at 122.2 proof. And that's just one point lower than the initial first release. Comprised of barrels ranging from 6 to 8 years old, the Larceny Barrel Proof will have a retail price of around $50, whereas the 12-year-old Elijah Craig Barrel Proof will be around $80. You can look for both of these coming to a Whiskey Quickie in the near future. For those that enjoy the Schonerbach beer from Texas comes a collaboration with Balcones and their new Texas Bach. It is a malt whiskey made from the exact recipe for Schinerbach beer, utilizing the brewery's mash bill and proprietary lager yeast strain to what they call create that remarkable flavor profile. It was aged in first fill American oak barrels for at least two years and made with a mash bill of over 51% malted barley. Balcones Texas Bach will be bottled at 50% ABV and will be priced around $40. It will also be available for sale at the distillery and retailers throughout Texas and Oklahoma for a limited time. And keeping on that Texas trail of bourbon, the Garrison Brothers Bourbon Distillery out of High Texas is releasing their Garrison Brothers Bull Maria Bourbon. This bourbon is aged for four years in staves that have been dry aged for at least 25 months in the Ozarks. Then the liquid was transferred to a second new American barrel and aged for another year, which of course we all know is rebarreling. It is finally bottled for this second release at 115 proof. The 2020 Bull Maria release will be around 6,000 bottles with a retail price of around $160. Now with more release news, New Riff is doing their spring 2020 special release with the New Riff Backsetter Bourbon and Rye. For this release, New Riff really focused on sour mashing process and used the backset from the peated malted barley in their mashing of their standard bourbon recipe. As they've mentioned, it resulted in a smoking flavor that is hauntingly unique with layers of peat enveloping a creamy, spicy bourbon and rye. The Backsetter 2-pack will be listed for a total of $99.98. And for today's podcast, we're featuring the Roundtable. It's another yet potentially controversial topic where we talk about the relaunch of the OKI brand and we examine some of the motivating factors behind it, not only just from New Riff, but from the new owners as well. 
We then take a look at the current landscape of craft distillers and if they will survive the current COVID-19 conditions. As a personal note, please make sure you're going out there and you're supporting your craft distillers. You're going to hear more about it in the podcast today. And lastly, we also talk about the return of age statements that we're seeing on the brand of Knob Creek. We're all excited to see that now as well. Joe from Barrel Bourbon wants you to know that it's gotten a whole lot easier to get their unique cash strength whiskeys from around the world. Just visit BarrelBourbon.com and you can click the Buy Now button. Bourbon to your door. It's as easy as that. Up next is Fred Minnick with Above the Char. So continue to stay safe and we'll see you out there soon. Cheers, everyone. I'm Fred Minnick and this is Above the Char. This is not going to be a pleasant above the char if you're someone who is eagerly waiting for the prices to drop because of the pandemic. Some time ago, I was having a conversation with somebody and I saw it also on Facebook and Twitter. This is a a consistent uh, theme amongst people in the bourbon community talking about how they cannot wait for the bourbon to uh, drop in price to take advantage of the pandemic. And I thought to myself at the time, you know, that's that's not a very nice thing to think because if we drop in price, that means people are going to lose their jobs. That means businesses are going to be going bankrupt. That means the bourbon boom that we've known that's kind of helped support this podcast and, and other cottage industries such as Mint Julep Tours and R&R Limousine and Pegasus, um, such as the travel industry that has become Kentucky Bourbon Trail. That means if all those prices start dropping and all those uh, wholesale barrels go out on the market for far less than they were, oh boy, yeah, you can maybe get a a once $65 bourbon for something like 40 bucks. But you know what? It also means somebody can't feed their family. That means somebody's going to be out of work. That means that the industry that we have known and loved that has been thriving and growing is on its way to a major, major decline. But when I first saw that, I was just kind of, I just kind of like ignored it and kind of moved on. And then people like Jack Rose and Silver Dollar started putting up their products for sale out of survival. And I was like, wow, okay, I get it. We're going to be okay. We're going to be okay. But as many of you know, I am also an active, um, an active vintage you know, buyer, and I'm always looking for the market for like, you know, rare gems. I was having a conversation with somebody uh, about a week ago, and I was talking about like all the lots that are up for sale. And he says, you know what, I'm going to wait just a little bit longer, a little bit longer, when people are much more desperate. And I don't know why that bugged me so much, because that is a part of business when you are someone who was uh, looking to buy something, you do want to buy when the person is, you know, willing to sell for the the least amount. And that just bugged me. And I'm not saying that we should we should be overpaying for for things in the vintage market, but I believe in fair markets. I believe in fair market value. I believe in paying for a a, a rare bottle of Dowling bottled and bond. Um, I believe paying for what it's actually worth and not waiting for someone till they can't feed their family. I think right now what we have seen, and in bourbon uh, to a lesser degree, but what we have seen with this pandemic, we have seen people for who they really are. We have two sides that are constantly bickering and fighting over how we should deal with this and blaming one another all the time. And then you have the majority of America right there in the middle trying to figure out what to do. And it seems we also have those who cannot wait for you to hit rock bottom so they can buy up your collections. So if that's you, or if you know someone like that, I ask you to please not be that way, to change your mind, to think of this as like a moment of of human, just being human. If somebody comes to you, you know, for you to buy their collection or to buy a bottle, you know, even if it's out, you know, encourage them to do it legally, of course, but be fair about it. Be fair about it because you don't know what that money could mean to that person's family. And that's this week's Above the Char. Hey, 
If you have an idea for Above the Char during this pandemic, hit me up on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. Just search for my name, Fred Minnick. Cheers. Hey, everybody, and welcome to the 44th recording of the Bourbon Community Roundtable. We've got a lot of people joining us live tonight as we discuss a good potpourri of what's new in bourbon news. And thankfully, we won't have to talk much about COVID because that really hasn't really uh, impacted much in the bourbon world. Everything is just kind of status quo. Um, There's a few hints of releases coming out. However, I think it's actually a good thing that hasn't happened because it keeps people away from going out and running and chasing bourbon right now in a time when you shouldn't be probably doing that. So everybody's kind of uh, being a little safe. Ryan, has your uh, purchasing habits for bourbon decreased now? Yeah, all my funds have allocated towards uh, to-go margaritas, swirl margaritas. <laughs> uh, I, we do those carry-out margaritas like three times a week. It's like when we first started, they would just give you the margaritas and a straw, and you're like, oh, well, you know, I guess I can have it in the car on the way home. And then <laughs> and then, uh, then they went to, we can't give you a straw. And you're like, okay. So I started bringing my own straws. And then it went to, you have to order an appetizer when you get it. So now it's... Uh, which is fine. So just get the chips and guac with it. But the swirl margarita, mojitos, if you're in mobile, excellent. There you go. So that's what you've been spending your money on. I actually bought my first bottle in a while today. I saw, I went to my local store to go and buy some things. Oddly enough, I had to get more tequila because we are running low because of margaritas and such. And considering we just kind of had, you know, Taco Tuesday and everything like that. Um, uh, and you know, Cinco de Mayo. So I think the, uh, one thing that I did buy was the the Makers 101, uh, that new like fancy box. Uh, so look for that in a whiskey quickie uh, coming soon at some point when Can't we wait. can. Uh, yeah, exactly. So let's go ahead and let's uh, let's kick it off tonight because we've got a lot of good topics as we start diving into this. And so I'm going to go with the person that's uh, in the middle towards the bottom of me and start with Brian Harris, Sipping Corn. Tell everybody where you blog. And then uh, let's start with a fun, fun question tonight. Um, and do oh, you believe in Lord. ghosts? Yes, I absolutely believe in ghosts. And uh, maybe I'll write a, there's some whiskey uh, blogs that I might need to do on, uh, on ghosts, but they're, they're true. Um, Find me at Sipping Corn mostly uh, on Twitter, also Facebook and Instagram and online. Uh, The, uh, the website is sippingcorn.com. You can also find it at bourbonjustice.com. Thanks for having me again, guys. Of course. And let's go to our good friend, Carrie over here. Carrie, how's it going? Good. Thanks, you guys, for uh, bringing me in tonight. Carrie from Suburbia.com, S-U-B-O-U-R-B-I-A. You can find me on Twitter at bourbon underscore gamer and Instagram at Suburbia. And yes, I absolutely believe in ghosts. And sometime when we're off on a tangent, I'll tell you all about the stories growing up in a house um, in Atlanta that was definitely haunted. Okay. Wow. I'm sitting on pins and needles. Can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> Call me later, Ryan. <laughs> yeah. All right, Nick, your turn. Hey, everybody. Uh, glad to see everybody tonight. I'm Nick, one of the three uh, founders of Breaking Bourbon. Find us online at BreakingBourbon.com and uh, check us out on social media, uh, all at Breaking Bourbon. We're on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, Patreon, and now uh, TikTok. So throwing up some videos up there, too. Oh, and, uh, man. You gave in. I'm going to be the, yeah, I joined you guys. We joined you guys. Um, but uh, I guess I'll burst the bubble here. I'm, I'm not a believer in ghosts myself. I like a good ghost story, but uh, that's about as far as I go. So, all right, Blake, you're up, buddy. All right. I'm uh, Blake from Bourboner and Sealbox.com. Uh, you can find me on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. That's B O U R B O N R. And then Sealbox is S E E L B A C H S. And I'm actually, you know, let's see, where's the vote at? Uh, um, I don't know if we're split, but I'm with Nick on this one. Yeah, not can't can't go down the ghost route. Um, you know, I, I, maybe it was too many like corny uh, tours as a kid through St. Augustine, Florida, which is about 30 minutes from us that that did be in. But no, if you know, they've made 10,000 TLC and Discovery show tv shows about it and they still can't track it down a ghost i'm gonna go ahead and say they don't exist so <laughs> a few more of these bourbon so and you never yeah, know you're, 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 you're people think hockey it. doesn't exist but i can go to instagram and see that it does exist so you know that's <laughs> 22 says the truth is out there ryan did you believe in ghosts uh 
sure. <laughs> I don't know. Yes, <laughs> Ghostbusters is like one of my favorite like movies. <laughs> so like I gotta believe in it. You know, I had the whole you know backpack and like thing you slide out and catch them. So uh, yeah, I'm all for them. I mean, it just kind of makes me wonder if like bourbon and ecto cooler would be a good combo then. Hey, I'm all for it. I mean, everybody remember Ecto Cooler? That was like oh, the, yeah. the with Slimer. Like that was the yeah. flavor back in the day. Oh, man, Absolutely. that was good shit. That was good shit. All right. So let's kind of move on to our first topic, because I think this is one that uh, is a little polarizing. And so this is something that has recently happened is that OKI, the brand that was originally owned by New Riff and kind of what put New Riff on the map, as everybody kind of recalls, they were putting out uh, anywhere between 10 to I think like 14 or 15 year old, 36% high rye MGP towards the end of it. We've had Ken Lewis of New Riff on the podcast before telling his story about how he bought those barrels when he was still, uh, when he owned the party source up in Northern Kentucky. And then he finally found a way to be able to turn that into another business and then sell those as a way to kind of, you know, really kind of get the, uh, the launching point going for New Riff. Now, what we found out is that the is that New Riff has sold off the brand and it is now being owned by two people that had also started the um, Blake. We were just talking about before we started the uh, what were the brands where they started? Remus. Yes. And, uh, um, yeah. What was the other one? I don't know. We just we just yeah. totally blanked on it. We're terrible. <laughs> I'm terrible host. That, I should have totally had this. Right. Remus Volstead. Is that the one? Well, it was uh, there's the George, George Remus, Remus brand, yes. the George Remus that's brand. That's the only one I know of offhand, but exactly the MGP brand. Exactly, yeah, MPP bought it from them. They gotcha. MGP okay. acquired it in sixteen from them. Mm. So let's kind of break this down a little bit because the one thing that that I'm kind of looking at this, I, I look at it in uh, the first aspect, and I'll, I'll kind of throw this out there: is why would New Riff want to sell OKI? Well, I mean, I think that you know they've kind of made it clear that they want to be all about the distilling. They waited those four years. Okay. I served his purpose. So why not cash in on it? You know, I don't know what the, um, you, you know, usually you go on like a base of, uh, sales multiples and that kind of thing for a brand. So this is probably a little bit different, but we talked about it a little before of it's kind of like the black maple Hill, you know, black maple Hill was this old brand that, um, I, I guess, was it originally with KBD or will it? And then, oh, yeah. you know, the people mm -hmm. out of California bought it and it dropped out of quality. Then it moved to Oregon. And um, I can't tell you how many people say, hey, I found a bottle of Black Maple Hill. And it's like, well, is it in a short squat bottle? Because you're not going to want to drink it for a hundred bucks. <laughs> right. But that but that business model works. You know, people, they've heard about this brand. It's got a little clout in the community. Um, so why not go ahead and, and, uh, you know, put some more bourbon in it. But I get that. I think, I think my, my question is why would, why would new riff and why would Ken Lewis actually want to get rid of something? Like they had something for so long. It was, it was successful. There's nothing that said they couldn't revive it years down from the road. Why would they just take it and sell it to somebody else? Like it, that's one part that I'm still trying to figure out and to understand here. So I think they, they, I think originally I actually dug up, I was looking around at websites, I actually dug up a website that's, that's still out there and it's new riff. I think they're old website. I'm going to share it up here on, uh, on YouTube, but it, it, it's got a whole kind of page dedicated to OKI. I'm not sure this is supposed to still be up or not on the web, but uh, you know, I almost feel like they've kind of at this point realized their success with new riff is so strong that that idea of ever going back to the OKI brand as part of New Riff, maybe they've just gotten to that point where they said, we just we just don't need it. That's not part of the vision anymore. You know, the idea was it was always going to be a short term brand, I think. But I get it. You kind of hold it in your back pocket just in case, you know, 10 years, 15 years down the road, you may want to reintroduce it. It's almost as if now they're looking, saying, you know what? we're not going to do anything with it. We still like the brand. If we've got people that are interested in taking that brand to a new height, we don't want it. Go ahead, guys. You guys take it. And we're doing our thing over here. So I think it's a lot attributed to New Riff's success that they've had now and the idea that they they probably don't plan on putting any resources into OKI or didn't for a long time. And they're saying if somebody else is going to, so be it. Take it. We'll take a little money and be done with it. Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, they think about the single barrels that had a lot of success in 2019, and a lot of them were new riff. I mean, they're they're proud of what they got with good reason. 
Um, it, to me, you know, think of another example. Who else could do this? And it's Smooth Ambler. If it's like Smooth Ambler getting rid of Old Scout once they have their own distillate, that's that's a bigger scale, I think, and that would be really surprising if they ever did that. But it's the same idea. Once you're once you're proud of your own distillate and your own product, you move toward that and and help keep the lights on by selling a brand. Did uh, did OKI ever get distributed outside of Kentucky? Ohio and Indiana. Uh, no, yeah, okay. I think it was just the, <laughs> the small, but, but it wasn't much outside, was it? I, I, mean, I don't think so. I think, yeah, it was like the tri-state area. Was kind because of what they have, they have like 50 barrels in total, right? Or it wasn't like there was massive amounts, was there? It was a finite number of barrels they started with. And that was always the idea was it was just going to fund their next thing. You know, it right. was never going to be a brand that continued. And it was never going to be a brand they were going to go try to source more to somehow continue at least that's what the how the story goes yeah because new yeah. rip has made its way now and it's coming to georgia and um yeah i feel I, i'm kind of with brian on that whole thing you you put your uh initial investment into that that one company but once you see that your heart and your soul is in the product that you're making and the label that you're proud of it's like what's the point of keeping behind you know i mean money speaks at the end of the day right mm -hmm. so yeah you're making yeah, and money from selling that label why not yeah, and, they, and the last time we were there, I mean, they got a ton of like expansion going and building stuff, and it's like they probably could have used the cash, you know, the capital. I mean, I don't know how lucrative a deal it was just to sell the brand off, um, but it might be too to meet some short-term cash needs that they need to, you know, keep growing the new Rift brand. And it's like, hey, you know, hell, I can't tell you how many okay I bottles I passed on, like just because I was like, ah, it's just MGP again, you know, huh? <laughs> stupid yeah. me, but. uh yeah, I mean, I don't know. I mean, it probably, I don't know how valuable that brand is, really. I mean, it's somewhat noticeable, but I'd say in the grand scheme of things, it's not, you know, that well known of a brand in the grand scheme of things. I mean, we as hobbyists, we know AK OKI. Right. If yeah. I were to go out and ask 20 people, you know, right. around town if they've heard of it, if they haven't heard of it. Yeah. I, I can't tell me people were like, Oki, that Oki brand or what? Oh, yeah. I mean, bring it to a big market and see if anyone knows anything about it. And yeah, I don't, I don't think they would. I, well, I think they're going to have to put a lot of effort into it to really get the snowball rolling again and take it anywhere um, from, from where it kind of is sitting right now, you know, beyond that tightly knit enthusiast market. But I don't think it has that massive, you know, appeal of like other big brands, but it it's an easier story to tell of, you know, where it came from and people kind of, Oh, have you heard a new riff? And, you know, it kind of, it, it, for me, it's just an easier segue for retailers to explain to customers why they're charging $120 for a bottle, but yeah, we'll see. And so I kind of want to put a thought in about, you know, the, the whole sales aspect, because I look at this, as let's rewind the clocks back like a, a I'd say a while ago, um, you know, when other brands were basically doing mass trading of labels and distilleries to basically stay afloat. And Ryan, you're probably right. Maybe this was something to get a quick, ca quick cash grab because who knows in 10, 15, 20 years if anybody's going to care about it. But it, it could also be in 10, 20, 15 years when people like us were like, holy shit, it's back. Like, oh my God. <laughs> <Right>. like, <laughs> like we would have like a party about it. This is just kind of like, oh, this seems a little weird, right? I mean, it yeah. seems weird. And it's like, if it's just two guys doing it and you look at a business venture out of it, like how much do you really think they paid for it? 10,000, 20,000, like 50, and, 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 oh, you really right. think they pay like $50,000 for this brand? Oh, I, I was thinking at least a hundred thousand. I was thinking a hundred myself think? too. I was thinking a hundred I mean, and I was, I was also thinking new riff might, they might've told the story, you know, these guys might've told the story of this is our plans with it. And that could have been something mm -hmm. that the folks at new riff kind of said, okay, we're, we're kind of seeing the vision We're it's not just about the money. It's about the idea that you're going to do something with this brand that we're never going to do and that we don't want to do and don't have any plans to do. And that might've been part of it too. Cause they did talk about kind of retelling that story and, you know, doing some things with this brand to kind of revitalize it, which obviously they need to do. But um, that may be part of it as well. It'd be really interesting to know what was paid for it. Yeah. Gosh, I wouldn't think. Uh, I, I just couldn't imagine paying more than like twenty five, thirty thousand dollars for it. But maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. It's just. I think. I think it, you're it, wrong. I, I, think I, well, I just. I'm trying to think of like out. a. I'm just trying to think of like percentage of business that limited releases are. You know, for for OKI or anyone, and it's not that much. And then you're trying to think about the margin you make on that, and I'm like, okay, 
that just doesn't seem like a valuable that much. Like, uh, I wouldn't pay much more than that to, to profit off that name, I guess, but maybe, I don't know. I'm an idiot. So who knows well, when they're, when the bottles <laughs> come out, see how expensive they are. Then you'll know yeah. how much. Yeah. 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 You'll, you'll figure it out really quick. Yeah. And so that kind of like tails and dovetails in the next part, because we, we, we look at this from our perspective and our perspective as enthusiasts and also keep this in mind. Nobody gave a shit about OKI until the MGP hype train started. Right. Right. I mean, it was around for a while. Some people were getting some bottles. They were 12, 13 years old. People liked it. Then all of a sudden the MGP chasers came around, cleared those out, then kept going and moving to the next distillery until every distillery is basically cleared out of this high aged MGP. So one thing that people have to understand is that this will not be the same product as you had before. And if you want it to be that, maybe you should not buy a bottle and wait an additional 10 years and maybe it'll be there because we all know that what's available on the market today that you're going to get from MGP is probably around five years old. If you're lucky, yeah. maybe six. And so I guess we we look at this and we think like, okay, if you are going to be under new ownership with this, how like what is that price point do you think that you need to be at and do you look at this as like a pure speculation of just like hey well, let's just ride the coattails of a brand that was known by um, a bunch of people in a bourbon community and the tri-state area and then try to make a national brand out of it what what's that what's that price point got to be at to be able to to do that and how do you stay competitive against everybody else in the market who's pushing mgp because you're not, I, you're not, you're not, you're well, not unique anymore. Let's keep it real. Who's to say they're going to be MGP though? I mean, do uh, we know that? Yes, because it says it yeah. in the press release it, that they are sourcing thirty six percent high rye MGP to do this brand. They're not steering away from what it was before. Yeah, I you got to be at like hundred dollars or more. Yeah. I think forty dollars is a good price point for if you're looking for something that you want to say, I want to take it national. I want this to be in just about every state or every state. Um, it's somewhat similar to other bourbons out there you're going to buy it because the flavor because the label maybe the story a little bit but i think 40 dollars is kind of that sweet spot where you're not so high that people are just going to ignore it um but you're high enough that they're going to look at it as an elevated brand out there so if, if they're putting out a 40 dollar bottle and it's hitting everywhere i think with the right marketing behind it and a decent flavor decent age i think they i think they could do it and make it something like like smooth ambler we're seeing that um, coming, coming back now. And that's at that price point. Um, for example, you know, if they want to go higher, if they want to go into that $700 range, they're going to have to really weave quite a story. I mean, think Kentucky owl kind of, you know, they're going to have to source some stuff that we didn't really know was available to source, or that was, you know, kind of a surprise to kind of hit those higher numbers or if they go above a hundred, but it'd be interesting to see if they kind of go towards that limited premium side or if they go towards that make it available to everybody's side on that lower price i think point. i think you guys underestimate the ridiculousness that people will pay <laughs> yeah for ridiculousness i, well said, I, yeah. I always Very think true. in my head that heaven's door <laughs> bourbon that was at total wine i think it was like 3.99 or 4.99 i'm sure it was sourced from somewhere maybe mgp um, oh the bootleg one yeah, the one that was like a well, it was like twenty seven year. years. It was like twenty seven years old. No, no, right? not that one. It wasn't that old. Um, oh, but it okay. said something like, "Here's it had in, included a guitar string from somebody and had a leather bound mm -hmm. notebook." And I'm and it was four ninety nine. And I'm thinking nobody's going to buy that. This is bullshit. And a week later, all three of them were sold out. You know, I think it's it's this is the ideal market if you want to push into you know marketing bullshit this is the market for it right now people are going to buy what you put out and, and all you need to practically do is charge a high price yeah I mean, and a fancy insane. bottle fancy you bottle high price bottle. and it's got instant prestige and there might not be anything to it and yeah as the comment is right now just put a horse on the bottle and it's 200 bucks. <laughs> done <laughs> that's it i think this is a market it's a perfect market well for somebody you know douglas uh, Pendleton put it in the in the chat. Uh, price drives perception, and that is extremely true in today's market. It's like, well, it's hundred dollars. It's got to be better than the bottle that's fifty dollars. Yeah. Um, Why would they only charge fifty if it's worth a hundred? Yeah. Because they had to pay two hundred thousand dollars for the brand. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it just went. It just the price just doubled, Blake. Yeah, yeah. just doubled. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the one thing that I, I see this, and this is just from a pure whiskey perspective, is that we've we've seen this story before. 
and we've seen and we've tasted this whiskey before and we know a bunch of different places that are putting out five-year mgp 36 percent high rye sorry y'all it's not ready yet in my opinion it's still not there um and i think there's still going to be a lot more time that needs to go into the barrel to actually make this live up to the hype of what it was before and so you're gonna have the same exact people that are getting burned by the same products and there it's just gonna be history repeating itself yeah are y'all ready for the big reveal it's me and kenny who bought it no, I'm <laughs> <laughs> totally kidding no, it's, it's, it's in a, a box it opens and it's five thousand dollars is that is that pursuit release 347 <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, yeah. yeah episode five hundred market gathering <laughs> Yeah, we're getting our own boxes that have like hydraulic lifts in it that just like nice. raise it up three inches so you can take it off its pedestal. They're yeah. they're holograms of Kenny's TikTok videos. You know? <laughs> <laughs> right. We've got to take the sticker game to the next level, right? We've just had to figure out how to do that to make people really Dude, want to. You know what's what took the sticker game to the next level and is underappreciated is Gifted Horse. It was a terrible whiskey, but did you know it was scratch and sniff? Yeah, I don't know if everybody knows. I can't that. believe nobody. I I can't believe no one else has done that after that because it's such a crazy, funny idea to me. I want a bottle just so I can have a scratch and sniff label again. Like, I don't even care that the whiskey sucks. Like, I, I want gifted horse yeah. again. Man, you love orphan barrels. I do. You're like, I'll trade a, uh, a round table <laughs> Buffalo Trace for a gifted horse. <laughs> it's worth $140 right there. <laughs> Get on it, man. Make it happen if you can. All right, so let's let's kind of move on to the next subject because this one is it's it's kind of a sore subject. Uh, this is definitely dealing with COVID and everything that that's been going on because according to a survey that has been released by the Distilled Spirits Council of the United States as well as the American Distilling Institute, with a survey of 118 craft distillers, they found that two out of three have worried not only about the short term but also the long term survival of their business, uh, and 42 percent believe that they will not be able to stay in business for more than three months. And another 21% are worried that they will go out of business within the next three months. And I believe also said that 43% of all craft distillery workers across the U.S. right now have either been laid off or furloughed. So we look at this right now that we are potentially in the craft boom bust. Now, the, the question for you all that I kind of have with this is that in a capitalist sort of mentality and opportunity here, why aren't more big players in this game trying to swallow up craft distilleries for dimes on a dollar right now. Before, before y'all, y'all yeah. know a lot about this, but I, I just have a question. Do they say, I mean, do they say why they're struggling? Because it seems like the spirit industry it. is booming right a lot now. Of you know, are with, shut uh, down. Yeah. Local distilleries, they, they have yeah. to own their yard. So like they really depend on tours and, you know, local events and tourism. Okay. You know, yeah, I was I was digging into that more too, Kerry, because everywhere you're seeing is how alcohol sales are up, and you're seeing it all over the place. If you're not seeing it on the news, you're seeing it with people you talk to, um, just your friends and family and so forth. You know, but I was looking at that too and started digging around a little bit about that and kind of found this this whole kind of change in dynamic of this idea that people aren't buying on premise now that they're buying from the online retailers or some of the big brick and mortars, you know, for the most part. And that's, that hurts their, basically the, these craft distillers, their major margin is what they're selling on premise with their bars, their restaurants, the stuff yeah. they're selling directly with the bottles. So where they're seeing their profit is basically dried up, even though they might be still selling some of their product. But then a lot of that stuff being bought online is the big name, lower price kind of stuff that people are just, you know, kind of rep repetitively buying. So all this craft stuff's going to the wayside and these guys are sitting on a lot of them and insane amounts of debt that they need to service. And it's a very short, it's, it's really pretty sad. I hope they don't go under to the, you know, to the extent that it looks like they could, but it's a very short window for them to either survive this thing or not survive this thing. Mm -hmm. I didn't think about how much is that, how much of their revenue is from people coming in. And on site, so they make a lot of their profit. Conservative, yeah, thirty percent is a pretty conservative estimate for most craft distilleries of of tasting rooms. Um, and you know, if they have a bar and that kind of stuff, it could be even higher. And you know, so all that's just gone out the window. So they're kind of making up with it with hand sanitizer, trying to 
you know, do what they can. Um, and to Nick's point, you know, whenever people are buying for a pandemic, they're grabbing, they're grabbing, vodka. They're just grabbing. Um, yeah, I think, think that's a good point. It's like people are drinking more, but they're not, you know, like one seven fives of like Evan Williams. And that's what they're, you know, mm-hmm. that's what most mm-hmm. people are grabbing right. for. They're not going for the higher price craft stuff. And so it's, uh, and, and two, like, you know, people are buying alcohol, but you know, restaurants and bars are like zero. <laughs> and so they, you know, a lot of the taste, like you all had said, the tasting rooms and visitor centers, you know, that these guys depend on are just, it's gone from to zero. And so it's, and and I don't really think they're getting any help either. I mean, the the PPP stuff goes to to employees and a little bit to rent, and that's not their expenses. I mean, they they have a lot of suck, sunk in expenses that they're just not really getting anything from the government on here. Um, yeah, because so they're, you have they're to losing use... their revenue, and they've still got to you know fund that vendome still and their construction costs and everything else. They're I mean, it's it's serious. I agree yeah, with Matt. Matt's comment there that hand sanitizer production is kind of caught up now. Yeah. Yeah. So what, you know, they don't need to do that anymore either. Yeah. And they, they struggle with that too. A lot of the regulations were tricky. A lot of them ended up making it and not even really being able to sell it. Um, they just, you know, made it a lot of it pro bono and a lot of cases that really wasn't a money maker per se. I think they just got stuck in a place where they didn't really need to produce whiskey and they were trying to help and you know trying to keep staff yeah and a lot of these places have a pretty low staff count too you know uh, yeah. to brian's point well, there's not a lot of people that work in a small craft distillery usually a lot of times it's actually just the owners uh maybe uh, that are that are working there you know and they're uh they're a lot of times they have a, just an incredible amount of debt to service that even in a perfect world when everything's going well it's a hard business so you just you just pull out one little piece you know, it's like a thing in a Jenga, pull out one piece, the whole thing's going to topple. And this very, very well could be the piece. I'd be curious, Blake, what you're seeing on the seal box side from the, you know, kind of like the online sales side there and, and people approaching you from the craft distilleries. I mean, what's kind of been your feel for these folks that you know pretty well? Yeah. So, so a lot of them are, you know, definitely feeling the, uh, feeling the effects of it. Most are making it, but most are making it. We got it. Yeah. Go to you know, I, Blake. Well, can we I, send Blake an Eero or something like a? I think it's. I think it's fun. <laughs> for I no, like, I think I, it's my computer. Hold on. I left there's the a podcast. Ghost, there's a ghost behind you, Blake. <laughs> I left the podcast almost two years ago, and Blake's internet still stayed the same. <laughs> <laughs> so true. True story. I, I, you know, I, I would say as much um, as this has been damaging for sm- so many small businesses and um, restaurants and bars and distilleries and et cetera. I, I kind of feel like maybe we're getting close to good news starting to prevail and hopefully coming out of this thing within a month. I mean, you, you start to look at, at least here in Georgia, we buckled down March 14th is when pretty much everybody went indoors and um, our hospitals are at a very low rate right now, and I'm, I'm just hopeful that we can kind of come back out now and, and support these craft distillers. I know that right before everything hit the fan, Wilderness Trail um, was distributed here in Georgia. And I kind of was just very curious to see how their sales went. And uh, my local store had bought uh, a couple cases of their, um, they had the weeded, the regular bourbon, and the, the rye. And all of it has to, has sold pretty well. He said he's ordered more of it. So hopefully um, we can get out of this thing and and get back um, to these craft distillers. This is the one thing that, that kind of strikes me a little bit. So I'm sitting here, I'm trying to read the chat and there's some people that are saying like, Oh, like it doesn't matter. Like their whiskey sucks. It's too young. It's too whatever. Like this is the, this is the moment and this is the movement that we need. Unless you want to keep drinking the same whiskey from the same six distilleries for the rest of your life. And I think that Blake made a very good point in his presentation that he did at Whiskey From Home during that that online conference and saying that if you're buying craft whiskey, you're not trying to buy something that is just as good or comparable as the big guys. Instead, what you're doing is you're trying to get something that makes you drink or t- taste something different. Right. Yeah, like yeah. you're, you're finding either new grains, you're finding uh, new ways that the, they, you know, they, they put it at like a different age proof or they, they, you know, they did whatever it is different because we all know that if you go to a heaven Hill or you go to a beam, you go to these different places, they've got 
you know, like one to maybe three or four recipes and they are cranking out stuff like on that still 24 hours a day. They're not changing. They're not experimenting. Right. And so it's, it's really hard for you to sit there and try to figure out like, okay, like I hope your palate or your taste doesn't change over the next 10, 20 years, because that's what essentially what we're going to get. And I know it's been a bad rap on a lot of craft distillers that they get, you know, like in this, this basically pigeonholed in this part where they said like, Oh, I'm sorry, your whiskey's too young. It's two, three years old. And it's, you know, it doesn't meet my flavor profile. I get it. I'm kind of with you there, but we've got to be able to give them a chance to be able to get to the point here at five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years old when this whiskey is really going to start being mature. And it does taste phenomenal that we've got a lot of options out there as consumers. 100%. And so, yeah. 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 And yeah, that, and, and yeah, and then there's some people that are talking about innovation. I think craft craft distillers are pushing the envelope for innovation. Uh, there's some people that have made a comment that said craft distillers have pushed the big guys to do things differently as well. And they're trying to, as we all have seen, the toasted barrels that have been coming out from everybody. But we can get we can do better than that. Like we can do more. Um, so that's kind of my uh, my two cents on it. All I'll say is I will I'm on board with any craft distiller that is not trying to cheat time. If a craft distiller wants to cheat time and use lasers to age their <laughs> shit, then I'm not on board with it. <laughs> if you are going to properly age your stuff and let time do its thing, I'm all for it. Absolutely. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, and even when you taste it at two to three years, you can kind of, you know, you can taste the future in it almost. Like you can say can they're on to oh, something. That's a tagline right there. <laughs> taste the future. All right. It's a cereal line or something. No, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, but no, I mean, you can see like, and you kind of, you're investing in them, reinvesting them that, I don't know. And it's just kind of cool to like be behind a brand like that nobody knows, or, you know, they're like one of the first and it's like exciting. You know, you feel like you're like part of their tribe and like part of their community and stuff. So I don't know. I think there's an opportunity with that, you know, craft distiller versus, uh, you know, the big boy who just doesn't give a shit about you. Like you can, you know, like we've had, you know, people know we have a partnership with, um, Finger Lakes and McKenzie and it's just like it's been so rewarding to do business with them and like like they're so excited and like they're just doing great things and it's just you know thanks to Blake for turning us on to them but it's just been you know incredible to be a part of that tribe and help, help helping them grow and whatnot so and you see their product change a lot too you know the a lot of the craft it's hard because if you try their product two yeah, years, three years ago four years ago a lot of them, if they are doing it right, whatever they're doing now is is not at all what it was before because they learn from that. That learning curve, the number of years it takes to learn is so much longer than it is with beer. They can't just go make another batch like these craft breweries can do. You know, they've got this long, you know, amount of time. So if you see a 10-year-old craft distiller that's still putting out 18-month-old, you know, bourbon and, you know, in 10-gallon barrels, you know, you guess, okay, you guys didn't really – evolve you know you didn't take it to the next step that you should have by this point you know but you got to give them time you got to give them that four to eight to ten or whatever years it's going to take to you know learn from their mistakes and bring it to that next level and i agree i think even even off the still i, I think you can taste if it's if it's you know good distillate or not you know if they're if they're distilling Absolutely. the right way if it's bad distillate you know what put in a barrel it's still going to taste like shit it might taste a little less like shit but it's still going to taste like shit. It doesn't matter if it's good distillate, a barrel is just going to enhance it and just going to make it better. And I think you do have that variation from distiller to distiller at, at the craft distillers. And man, I got to tell you, it's going to be a sad sight if a year from now we're sitting looking back and saying, yeah, two thirds of them did actually go out of business. And now that's that many, you know, fewer that are going to have that shot at showing us what they can do. You know, hopefully, that's not the case because I'm excited for what the next five, 10, 20 years is going to look like with this craft boom that we're seeing right now. Hey, Ryan, and real quick on that note, uh, remember we did our, we did a blind tasting not too long ago and you sent the McKenzie. Is that what you sent? Oh yeah. 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 Yep. So r rewinding back to 2014, my wife, when I first got into bourbon, signed me up for bourbon of the month club. And one of the first bur craft bourbons I got was McKenzie out no of way. finger legs. And I remember thinking, God, this is just, this so young and uh, the label's kind of cheesy. And then a couple years later, I saw an updated label and I was like, well, that looks kind of cool. And then you sent um, the most recent batch of theirs and I was blown away by how good it was. It is the perfect example of 
craft whiskey given time to perfect their craft. Taste the future. Yep. No. So, okay. Now this gets me back to my original point. In this sort of state that we're in, is there a reason why we don't see anybody buying up a lot of distilleries that could potentially be going out of business? What do you get if you mix Seattle craft, Texas heritage, and Scottish know-how? That's Two Bar Spirits. Two Bar Spirits traces its roots to a ranch in rural Texas run by the founder, Nathan Kaiser's family for six generations. Nathan grew up on the ranch with stories of relatives bootlegging moonshine. And after moving into Seattle, he wanted to keep the family tradition alive and he opened Two Bar Spirits in 2012. They're a very traditional distillery, making everything from scratch and each day starts by milling a thousand pounds of grain. Their entire product lineup consists of only two whiskeys, their moonshine and the only bourbon made in Seattle. Both bottles are being featured in Rackhouse Whiskey Club's next box. Rackhouse Whiskey Club is a Whiskey of the Month club, and they're on a mission to uncover the best flavors and stories that craft distilleries across the U.S. have to offer. Rackhouse ships out two of the featured distillery's finest bottles, along with some cool merchandise in a box delivered to your door every two months. Go to rackhousewhiskeyclub.com to check it out and try some two bar for yourself. Use code PURSUIT for $25 off your first box. Is there a reason why we don't see anybody buying up a lot of distilleries that could potentially be going out of business or putting their their you know their their equipment up for sale or whatever it is that you know keep the product going? Because we've seen only a few really get acquired over the past few years. And, and probably Woodenville might be like one of the biggest names that we've actually seen recently of a big conglomerate that's bought a craft whiskey and really pumped a lot of money into it so they could produce more. Like, why are we not seeing that more? I don't, I think a lot of them, Kenny, aren't to the point where they're buyable or sellable or however you want to think of it. Hmm. I think somebody, you know, like Woodenville, they're, they've gotten there, they've invested what they need to invest to get there. They've got distribution they need to get there. They've got the time you need to get there. But I think in a lot of cases, the big guy is just going to do it better on their own. You know, they don't necessarily need to do that. You know, if they start from scratch, they're going to be able to do it. So they're only going to buy something that, they, it's, that they've already succeeded so once they've succeeded now they're a potential for you know a sale and the problem is a lot of these have not really reached that success yet they're still on that path to the success and the problem is if you clip them now they can never get there they can't get to that point where they've got enough value to be able to ride something like this out or be bought by somebody bigger or something like that yeah woodenville is like a a perfect storm it's like right there you know it's in 30 minutes from seattle they had distribution in california i mean which is the number one you know, drinking state close to Texas. It's like a, you know, just incredible product, incredible story. It's like, you know, I think it really just depends where you, these guys are located because most of these craft distilleries are very regional focused. And so if they're in a region where, you know, they're, you're in a position to capitalize off of, I think it makes sense. But other than that, it's, you know, it's hard to, uh, it's hard to, pony up some big bucks just to you know win a regional player i don't know you know there's somebody in texas you know that's like uh, it, up yeah. and coming Re regional and, player who's in a lot of debt right now i mean you're if yeah. you're buying that debt i mean you yeah. can you can make up a, a story and you know pit you know pirate a few of the people and and then you've got your own story and your little sub brand without buying all that debt i mean it's it's a, it's a tough buy to make if if this truly is a sinking ship and that's how the big guys are looking at it, why would they jump in as almost like a bailout now? Like it, it, it sounds bad, but they would probably just let them blow up, you know, go through bankruptcy, get rid of the debt, and then they could come in and make an offer. Um, but, you know, to just jump in and try to buy everything. Like Brian said, you know, they're strapped with debt. There's all this other stuff. Where's the advantage? Um, whereas most of these guys that we're seeing get bought up like a rabbit hole and that kind of stuff. Um, they had good distribution or like a Kentucky owl who had a national um, uh, national presence without actually being distributed. So there, there's kind of a course for making them a large national brand. So the way that I also see this is that a lot of the big players um when i say players the people that are other larger portfolios of spirits they essentially needed whiskey or a bourbon in their portfolio and that's when some of the buying happened you know if i take this and i try to relate it to what we see inside of the tech world i look at it as 
um, you know, for the, a lot of the big companies, they don't really try to innovate because they just don't move fast enough. Um, so what they do is they wait for one or two players to fight out a new technology inside of the space. They kind of see who emerges. And before, be, before that technology becomes mainstream or grows big, they swallow them up and then they pump more money into them so they can grow bigger and help grow that business. So it just kind of, it, I, I kind of see that as kind of like a difference in this world versus that world where there is an opportunity for a lot of these companies to be able to go and try whiskey from a lot of different places and be able to figure out like, okay, like we can figure out who's, who's got potential here. Who could we swallow up and, and who could we, you know, really help our portfolio at the end of the day. I mean, some of this too is just based on the economy, right? Like in a, in an economy that's booming, you want to spend money, you want to acquire, you want to go out and do those kind of things. But in, in an economy that we're in right now, where it's, it's kind of fear-based, right? It's kind of like, hold on, steady the ship. Let's, let's just get through this and um, hopefully come out on the other side. I think, don't you think that might have some impact too on, on some of these companies, maybe buying up other companies? Yeah, I mean, I would oh, say yeah, sure. I would say right now there's there's a lot of hesitation just for anything. I mean, everybody's it doesn't really matter how big your portfolio is. Like you're you're losing money right now. Yeah. Uh, however, it is also an opportunity cost, and that's what also we we look at in our own daily lives. When the stock market took a shit, what did we do? Did we sit back and wait, or did we look at this and like, hey, this is a good time. Let's go invest some money. I know that you know. It, it just depends on where you sit comfortably at of like, where do you, where do you look at this as an opportunity to go either invest or do you look at it as something like we should just hold tight and, you know, count our pennies while we still have them. Yeah. Yeah. But I, th I think they'll have a while to uh, <laughs> figure like, I, I, I just think this is going to drag on longer than we want it to. And uh, the, it's just so uncertain right now what's going to happen, you know, and it's, and it's, it's regional because the States are so in charge of like, and like I said, these craft guys are so regional. Um, it's it's kind of hard to predict which way it's going to go, one way or the other. Any other final thoughts before we move on? No, I just I want to do a GoFundMe for Blake's internet. Yeah, <laughs> seen a few <laughs> of them. That's getting that's getting uh, um, that's the next thing on the list to get fixed. Can, did any part of my answer actually get into the? Uh, into the show or is it just all start cutting up you know it's sometimes shopping. blake we just look at your face your pretty face and, <laughs> and just yeah, it's off. really enjoyable so we're, we're good and we I just forget what you're saying when, yeah yeah i know it's bad when my brother's texting me like you know you're frozen right like, <laughs> yes i know i'm frozen i'm trying to figure it out uh but no i mean i, I think it is you know it, it is a big thing and we'll see how it plays out but for people getting bought up i i just don't think it'll be the right time until we can actually see what plays out and i hope that's not what happens you know i want to see more independent craft distillers out there kind of doing their thing and uh being supported by either their local community regional community and all that stuff so i think that's that's a advantage for the drinker so if we lose that um you know that's a big loss yeah and and i don't know who's left to be purchased really you know who's got Pretty Ryan. wide national, right? There's two thousand distilleries across the nation. We've yeah. tried like this many, so it's like there's, oh, there's I know, so many but I'm more. just saying, like, you know, I, I understand there's yeah, but most of them are not. Besides Wilderness Trail, you know, they, I mean, that would be probably the the one you would think would be the most appealing to investors. Um, but other than that, I mean, and not just because Pat's in the chat, but um, <laughs> but even like a even but, like a barrel I mean, or. Uh, or yeah, I guess barrel. Know, there, yes, there's, there's there's all kind. Of, but you know, you think about, I, I mean, like a high wire who gets all kinds of national attention for their Jimmy Red Corn. Who's that? Um, <laughs> uh, they're in Garden. They were Garden Guns uh, product of the year last year. So they're always in like the um, anything made in the South. There in it. Um, y you know, there's there's a lot of different ones out there, but. Um, it is a different business model than like the beer guys. So as soon as one brewery gets hot, Budweiser or InBev, whoever it is now comes in and buys them up. Um, it's a little bit different on the distilling side. Yeah. And then the, and then with the beer too, I mean, I've noticed Goose Island, uh, Bourbon County stud has been on the shelves here yeah. since, yeah. since Christmas, since Thanksgiving consistently. So, you know, with beer, you can just ramp up production. You know, they've already got a product that's hot. They can increase the production on that right. product. They can just get it distributed. 
And you know what? And maybe if maybe for a while, maybe people feel like it's still exclusive. And now it's like, well, now I see it on the shelves all the time. So I'm not as enticed to buy it because I know it's going to be there the next time too. Why do I need to stock up on it? You know, but with all these craft distilleries, if they don't really have a brand that everyone's kind of behind already or that's really hot and they can't really produce that quickly and they don't really have distribution, you got to start to think, well, what are we really buying here? What, what is it that is going to bring some value to somebody else? So you're going to need some of that magic in that recipe because it's not like the technology, like you were talking about, Kenny, where somebody has created some new thing that can be a component or some, you know, some part of something else. I mean, everyone in a lot of ways is, is really kind of doing the same thing. They're just, they're doing it with a different story and a different feel and a different flavor profile and some different people behind the scenes, you know, that kind of thing. So if they don't have some of that magic and momentum to start, which is what they work so hard, you know, to get in the first place, then it, what is there really to buy besides a whole heck of a lot of debt, you know, and the problems of a company and maybe a person that that's, wants control that won't give it up to anybody, you know, that you're going to, that's going to come along with that, you know? So I think it's just that type of business that's not as, saleable as you might think um and then a lot of people who are going to get involved are going to get involved on their own because they're passionate about it they're going to start from scratch you know or they're a big company and they're just going to wait until somebody's done all the legwork and they can kind of sweep in maybe pay a little bit more but you've already kind of brought up that point that they've struggled with you know them themselves like for example mgp how have they not really been able to get a product of their own to be popular you know like they're a good candidate to say Let's buy a brand that's become popular. You know, as we noticed with George Remus, for example, they, they did in the past. And they, you know, bought some more too, I believe. You know, but that's an example of just like they don't have that magic and momentum to do it. So they might be out looking for somebody else that can do it if they really want to get in that game. Whereas a lot of these other big brands, they, they already do that themselves. So who are they going to be? Who, who would they buy? Why would they buy anybody? I don't know about the big brands getting in. I want Pursuit Series to have their own distillery. So when someone goes belly up, I want you guys to be there ready and own a distillery. Yeah, I could see us just look at the white dog and it tur turns out like green. We're like, eh, it's close enough. Yeah, I can, the white dog, I, green can barely, dog. Uh, I can barely make like my own bleach cleaner for my wife's hair salon. So much less, uh, <laughs> you know, distill it. I want you to create a distillery. Right? What was that saying? Future, the best in the future. Or yeah, taste the future. Yeah. Taste the future. Taste the future. I mean, Just call it heads and only give the heads of every production and put it in <laughs> a bottle. <laughs> Just call it. I like that. <laughs> Pursuit heads. With, yeah, it comes with a Pursuit gift card. To, yeah, it comes with a gift card to Walgreens so you can buy yourself some readers after you start losing vision. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So let's kind of uh, start wrapping this up a little bit with like a, a, a one last subject here, because we look at, you know, we, we've talked a lot about today, you know, craft distilleries and stuff like that. However, there is one distillery that is now bringing an age statement back, which is kind of almost unheard of. And so we look at what Knob Creek has done recently. So Knob Creek for a while, and should I say this was, I think, uh, God, what was it, two, three years ago, they actually took off their age statement from their regular standard releases. However, we used to see like up to like 14 or 15 year releases that would actually happen at private barrel selections. So the one thing that we're finally seeing is that now there is, I believe it's a, a 12 year blue label and I think it's a nine year brown label um, that is starting to make their way back. And I know, Nick, you all have done a, a, a recent review on the 12 year, I believe, correct? Yep, the 12 year, Jordan reviewed it. I haven't had it yet, but he, he liked it quite a bit and the response was really positive on the 12 year. I think it's funny because a lot of people talked about, well, why would you buy that when you could buy a 14 year old single barrel that's higher proof for maybe less? But I think, I don't know about you guys, but if you've had some of those single barrels, there's definitely winners and losers in, in the mix. Definitely. They're kind of all over yeah. the place. So I think the idea there is with this, it's a, there's a lot more consistency. Um, so you're not really rolling the dice this the same way. And there's pros and cons of that. But uh, cool to see that that 12 years on there at, at a, not a not an insane price either. You know, definitely a, a manageable uh, price tag for that. I think it's awesome when people when when the 12 year comes in and stores market up higher than the 15 year single barrel that's right to the left. And yeah. people buy the 12 year and they're like, I got the knob 12 year. Yes. And you're like, never mind. Just take it home. <laughs> Enjoy it. Congratulations. Enjoy it. Yeah. Yep. Congratulations. 
It just and so shows I, you how many barrels uh, Beam is sitting on. You know, that, for, that's what I'm saying too. Back, you know, it, it's like we couldn't pump enough through the private barrel program. Now we're just going to come out with a, you know, a 12 year age statement. So, it, you know, it, and that shows how much they're distilling right now too. You know, they're they're passing another million barrels. It seems like every other month or something. You know, I see the press release. So. Um, you know, that's, that's great to see. It's another good one on the shelf that you can tell people to go try and hopefully it's available and it's fairly priced. And, um, yeah, I think that's a good thing. I got to ask this question though, see what you guys think. So I mean, just maybe a conspiracy theory, but you know, I love it. Maybe there's a lot of it, but is there any theory out there or any thought that putting out all these, you know, higher age, 14, 15, they're really trying to just get that, build that momentum behind the brand. You know, we just talked about OKI. We talked about MGP, those high ages. Then they came down and people just got ravenous for this stuff, kind of hunting that higher age that kind of didn't exist anymore. You know, do you think that was at all part of their strategy was let's kind of just bombard the market with this high age, low price stuff, make everyone go a little bit crazy. And then in a way, almost kind of like eh, take it away, but, you know, kind of push that out. And now we'll get some age statements in there. You know, but have people kind of chasing that, chasing that feeling, so to speak. I mean, any thoughts on that? Or do you yeah, think can I can I can I piggyback on that for a second? Absolutely. In Georgia, um, we went through a ton of 14, 15 year Knob Creek barrels to the point where stores were asking uh Beam for more Knob Creek. Man, we got this awesome 14 year. We sell put them at 49.99, they sold out. I need more of it. And Knob Creek said, well, yeah, you, you were going to continue the program, but unfortunately we're out of the 14, 15 years. We've got some younger stuff. We've got nine to 11 year. And they said, okay, cool. We'll go with the nine to 11 year. And they did that for a period of six months. And then that began to slow down a little bit. And all of a sudden they said, oh, you know what? We found a whole bunch of 14, 15 year barrels again. And now those are starting to come back out too. So Knob Creek, I mean, Beam knows what they're doing. 100%. So if you think that they are not using this market and using marketing and having people tell them what to do, then you are flat out wrong because they know what's up. Well, yeah. to kind of go with what Nick was saying, I am excited to see that there is a return of an age statement on a on a bottle. I mean, for many bourbon drinkers, it's just a it's a good nice to nice to have, nice to see. However, I think there is a little bit of concern and as as Nick kind of mentioned is that or and I think Carrie mentioned too is that the the price for the 12 year is actually more expensive than it is for a single barrel private pick of something that could potentially be the same price or older this kind of leads me to believe when this is all kind of over and we start getting back into potentially doing knob creek picks again what's going to be available are they going to not there be like wait a minute like we're we're pumping out our own product that's 12 years plus that, like why would we put those barrels into the single barrel program I would venture to leave, believe that we're going to see less than 12 years going forward with inside of this program. I think they just have so many. I mean, that, that might be right, but they have so many barrels and well-aged barrels. And I don't know where they've been all this time over the last few years. Maybe they're just putting it in things that don't have age statements. But I think we'll still see f at least fairly comparable. You'll be able to at least get a 12-year barrel pick. Uh, maybe not the 15s anymore, but you'll be around the same same age and they'll they'll increase the price. Yeah, well the 1415s came back and with a higher price to yeah. Georgia. Well, you know what though too, I mean when they removed the 9 year age statement, you know, they said we it's, we can't sustain it. And they've reverted from that, but why remove that say you can't sustain it and then suddenly you're flooding with single barrels cuz you got more than you can handle and they're 14 15 years old. You know, what's the what's the play there is there are there really old ones and, and and really young ones Do they miss a gap there what happened you know why would they go one direction and then go back the other direction i mean i know like to carrie's point they know what they're doing at the same time it, you know i don't know if they're trying a couple different things with it you know swinging a little bit for the fences as to how they play with the marketing and things like that you know I mean, you look at like other companies I mentioned Buffalo Trace, like why did in, why did the insanity for Buffalo Trace even happen? Why did that insanity for OKI when it did happen kind of kind of happen there? Why did the insanity for Black Maple Hill happen? You know, are they trying to play into that in a way to try to somehow manufacture the insanity with some of these ages and moving things around, taking them away, giving them back? 
maybe that's maybe that's the whole play. You know, maybe they have enough of everything, or maybe they're really playing their cards tightly to their chest, and they kind of know when they're trying these different strategies to get people to kind of get in and fall in love with Knob Creek the same way that they love some of these other products. Black Mabel Hills because of Stitzel Weller. That's why I was insane. <laughs> but, but you know, you're exactly right. It's they. I, who knows? It's you know, it's like they went the whole Booker's thing. It's like yeah, they go, they go they out there like bookers. you know they test like they go out there and see what people how people react and then they pivot you know one way or other, which is kind of smart. But uh, yeah, ghosts, ghosts. I mean, it's ghosts. all ghosts. exactly. Yes. It's all about the ghosts. It all comes back it. to ghosts. Matt's the best. I'm gonna give Matt a sample after this. Nice. When I give away stuff. <laughs> oh, Jerry's been drinking enough. He's giving away samples. Welcome to the samples sample are coming. Of the evening. Samples are coming. <laughs> All right. Well, let's go ahead. We'll begin the sample uh, sample uh, pile outs here in a second. Let's go ahead and kind of wrap this up because I want to thank everybody for joining us uh, on this 44th edition of the Community Roundtable. Uh, we actually had a great, great amount of people joined us live tonight. I think I saw up to 150 concurrently. So that's fantastic. Glad to have you all here. So one more time going around the horn. Uh, Blake, we'll start with you before you lose internet. <laughs> yeah, guys, uh, you know, it, there's two things you can count on on the round table. That's I'm going to be here and that's my Internet's going to go out. So uh, that's consistent as always. Uh, thanks for having me, guys, and, and dealing with it. So uh, you can find me at all the social medias, bourboner.com, sealbox.com. And thanks again. All right. Kerry. Hey, guys, Kerry. Uh, uh, my blog's called Suburbia, I think, and uh, <laughs> suburbia.com. <laughs> Um, Twitter, uh, Instagram. I do want to say something though. If you guys, um, didn't check out recently, Kenny and his crew put together this conference from home. It was called whiskey at home. I, I hope all of you guys tuned in to this amazing, um, thing that was, was put on. And, um, I was asked to be a part of it and got to catch up with all the stuff. Like it really was the, an incredible, incredible event that Kenny and, and the crew put on. And, um, I just want to say thank you for putting that thing together and bringing me in. And I would, I want to say, I think it's going to segue once we're past all this coronavirus stuff. I look forward to the largest in-person whiskey conference in from Kentucky. Home. Yes. From, from my house, house. <laughs> but also in Kentucky. And I think that you're the man to put that stuff together, both of you guys and everyone involved in it and um, look forward to being involved in that too. I, I do really well in figuring out stuff on the internet. I don't know about the in-person thing because then I got to worry about people with <laughs> peanut allergies or something. Uh, and I'll, I'll screw something up. Let Let's Fred handle there. all that then. Because <laughs> yeah. Yeah. you know he's a detail guy. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. No kidding. <laughs> Just kidding, Fred. We, we love you. He wasn't feeling well tonight, so that's why he's not here tonight. If anyone else was uh, kind of wondering, he needed a, needed a little bit of break. So, Nick, go ahead, buddy. All right. I'm Nick from Breaking Bourbon. Uh, breakingbourbon.com. Uh, find us on uh, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, Patreon, TikTok at Breaking Bourbon. And I uh, had a fun chat tonight, guys. Nice catching up. Uh, like I said before, I haven't been on one of these with Carrie in like a year and a half. Actually, I don't think I've been on a round table in about three or four months now. So uh, good to see you guys again. And uh, thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Well, we're glad you're back. Good thing the, uh, the, the baby sleeping regimen starting to get going for you, too. I, th I heard some some noises uh, while we were on this. I, I, you couldn't. I, I don't know your uh, spider sense through the <laughs> microphone, maybe. You know, but uh, hopefully we're good now. Not gonna Just turn up the sound machine. That's yeah, what I always yeah. did. If you need kid <laughs> advice, ask Blake. He's got like eight of them, uh, so like he can help you out. <laughs> He's been through every situation. Like three more <laughs> this week. Yeah. <laughs> he wrote baby wise. Yeah, that's what happens bourbon, when internet you internet work. You just, you just have kids, you know, no internet. Yeah. <laughs> that's actually the problem. I'd have, like, I'd have four less kids if I had good internet. So. Yeah. <laughs> just get bored over there. <laughs> it's not good that All right, Brian, you're up. All right, thanks again, guys. Uh, Brian with Sipping Corn. Find me on Twitter at Sipping Corn, Instagram and Facebook, and SippingCorn.com and BourbonJustice.com. And back to Carrie's point on, on whiskey from home, that was fantastic. Everybody check it out. Check out the links. It's still available. And uh, Ryan, I think, is going to end up with a TV show out of this gig. I mean, you've got all these cooking shows and these, you know, home building shows. And you're going to have Ryan as a as a bartender showing you how to make 
you know, New York, New York Sours on, on his show. I mean, it's going to be fantastic. Well, yeah. Stay tuned for can't it. Can't screw up the floater on air when I nailed it all week. I was, yeah. like, so, I was so nervous. I don't know why. I was like, I lost sleep the night before. Like, oh my God. You and Rachel Ray are going to have the best show. No, Giada. Well, I'll, do, I'll partner yeah. with Giada. Yeah. How about I heard she's calling. I heard she's calling. She wants to pair up on a new show. Oh man, that'd be my dream. Do it like in Capri or something. No, it it was an awesome event, and like the, it, it was crazy how well it ran, and however how on time everyone was. Like it was like precise almost. It was kudos to Kenny. That was his uh, brainchild, and uh, give him all the credit because. Uh, I just showed up and made cocktails, so uh, I, I, I don't deserve much. But yeah, appreciate everyone joining us tonight. I mean, it's this is one of our favorite things to do the round table and, you know, act like we have an opinion that matters on something. So uh, make us feel important for a few, few minutes. So, but anyways, yeah, thanks again for everyone tuning in and uh, we'll see you next week. Cheers. Cheers.